Hello, everyone. Thank you for attending our third webinar in our Child Trafficking webinar series. Our presenter today is Latera Davis. She was appointed as the Director of Victim Services for the Georgia Department of Juvenile Justice on July 1, 2012. Effective March 16, 2014, the unit was expanded to include victim, volunteer, and chaplaincy services. As the director, she provides statewide leadership and oversight, development and implementation of policy and training, public education, and outreach, serving as the statewide leader in commercial sexual exploitation and developing community resources and networks which support and enhance program objectives. Ms. Davis has been employed with the Georgia Department of Juvenile Justice for over 16 years. Since her employment, she has served in various field-based and leadership capacities. Ms. Davis holds a master's degree in social work and a master's degree in public administration. She is a licensed clinical social worker, registered mediator, certified victim offender dialogue, victim advocate, sex offender counselor, and grant writer. We would like to thank the Casey Foundation for making this webinar possible. If you have questions, please type them in the Q&A section on your screen. I would like to note that we will be showing a few videos today. If you have difficulty seeing these, we will be posting the links in the chat box for you. All right, Latera, if you would like to start, you may. Thank you, Alice, for that introduction. Um, once again, my name is Latera Davis, and I am a director with the Department of Juvenile Justice in Georgia. This particular training is going to discuss commercial sexual exploitation of children and providing a more of a trauma-informed approach to the juvenile justice system. The purpose of this presentation is to educate and raise awareness for juvenile justice professionals on the complex needs of youth who are at risk or exposed to commercial sexual exploitation and integrating a trauma-informed approach to supervision and care of exploited youth. You'll find during this presentation, I may not go over every slide in detail. Some of it is for your information but we will have a discussion on all of the content areas. Um, during the presentation, participants will gain an understanding of the definition and prevalence of commercial sexual exploitation, understand risk factors, pathways to entry, and how commercial sexual exploitation impacts victims and communities. Learn best practices for interviewing, identifying, and investigating victims of sexual exploitation, and discuss trauma-informed services and best practices while identifying an effective and collaborative response to sex trafficking. I do want to note that the term commercial sexual exploitation, we usually call CSEC. However, from the federal level, the new definition is domestic minor sex trafficking. So if you hear that, those are interchangeable terms. Under the Trafficking Victims Protection Act of 2000, Sex trafficking is the recruitment, harboring, transportation, provision, or obtaining of a person for the purpose of a commercial sexual act. The commercial sexual act is induced by force, fraud, or coercion in which the person performing such an act has not attained 18 years of age, or the recruitment, harboring, transportation, provision, or obtaining of a person for labor or services by means of force, fraud, or coercion. When you look at some of the definitions for force, fraud, and coercion, I find it really interesting because when we interview and intake youth in the juvenile justice system, they have a difficult time seeing themselves in any of these capacities. For example, when you look at fraud, if a child is on the run and is, is, is um, identified by somebody in that community as a runaway or homeless youth, and that particular person says, okay, I'm going, to, I'm going to give you housing and shelter so that you'll have somewhere safe to stay. I'm going to be your friend. You know, you can stay here as long as you need. You don't, you don't owe me anything. Um, you just have a safe place to stay. And once that child gets there, I want you to look at how fraud could easily occur. If the child was promised somewhere safe to stay without having to do anything, but then within a day of being there, they're told they have to have sex with somebody, in order to continue to stay there, that's a false promise or deceitful behavior. Or if a child, oftentimes that we interview, we're, they're told that the person loves them, that they're their boyfriend, even though they just met them two, two or three days before, they enter into that relationship thinking it is a relationship and where, as what we have found with youth who have been commercially sexually exploited, it's not a relationship. It becomes a power and control type of relationship 
and fraud is used in that the child thinks that that's their boyfriend and it's not. Commercial sexual acts include, but not limited to, pimp control, street prostitution, escort services, residential and underground brothels, cyber pornography, internet-based exploitation, private parties, familial pimping, erotic nude massages, stripping, and gang-based prostitution. In Georgia, we have seen an increase in the amount of gang-based prostitution that's being reported. I have had experience that within certain cultures or communities, it is very difficult to um, have a, um, for example, a young lady identify themselves as being a victim. I have interviewed several young ladies in, in the Atlanta area of that are involved with Hispanic gangs, and they will not admit to being involved in any gang-based prostitution. They will not identify any of their offenders that they were involved with with their crimes, nor will they identify other people in the community who may have helped to exploit them. I know people wonder about the familial pimping side of it. We have, we have several cases that have been prose prosecuted for familial pimping. Um, in one particular community in Georgia, we had a family who was um, pimping out their four-year-old child in lieu of a buy here, pay here lot car. So they would provide, they were giving their child to the owner of the car lot in, in, in exchange for sexual favors for the car payment. It's unfortunate and it happens and it's very important that you have a very strong relationship in the juvenile justice system with your local foster care and how you can identify and respond to those cases. Some of the myths and stereotypes, and, and, and these, some of these myths and stereotypes I'm identifying within our own system, within the juvenile justice system, criminal justice, um, law enforcement officers, and that's one that they're just bad kids, that they knew that when they went on the run that something could happen and they chose to take this lifestyle on, that at any point that they are on the run or involved in this type of lifestyle that they can leave. You know, it, and it's not a victim, that it's a victimless crime, that some of the girls enjoy, or boys, enjoy being exploited. They, they, they make a lot of money. And one, that girls are only involved. We've had an increase in number of identified boys in the last year, and a lot has to do with how um, that we've educated staff and different community members in making it comfortable for young males to be able to report such abuse. I'm not going to go over every statistic, but you, this is a common statistic that's being discussed. About up to 300,000 youth who are exploited. The average age is between 12 and 14, and another 200,000 200, are at risk for tra sex trafficking in the United States. From a C-sex survivor, this is not a choice. And, and many of the survivors I talk to, I look at it and I talk to them, it's almost a combination of a child who has um, been a victim of domestic violence and then who's caught up in a lifestyle in a gang like somebody who has been involved with substance abuse. You know, it's not like they just woke up one day and said, hey, you know, I want to be exploited. This is not a life they choose. And as much as it may seem glamorous with the videos and anything else, and when they talk about it with, to each other, they may make it sound glamorous, but it's not a life they choose. And that it's not that easy for them to just walk away from it as well. Some of the risk factors. One of the main risk factors is just being a preteen adolescent female. Any adolescent female who is preteen and older is is at high risk for being exploited. And then, as the risk fa the risk factors increase with history of abuse and neglect, socioeconomic marginalized youth, history of runaway, and psychological or emotional problems. Um, one of the young ladies that I have who, who frequently is involved with our system, she had every single risk factor that you can imagine. And that risk factor just, the more she ran, it steadily progressed. She was, they had a very low IQ. Um, the last time she came into our care, she was pregnant. Um, she ended up having a miscarriage because of the number of STDs that she had that could not be treated at that time. She had a parent who was not neglectful, but the parent was low functioning as well. She had been in and out of the foster care system because of the parent's um, ability to care for her because of her functional status. Um, so she was in a low income family 
and she first entered into what we know of involved sexual exploitation at the age of 11. This is pretty common in some of the girls that we interview. I'm not saying it's common in every single child who's been exploited, but by the time they make it into the juvenile justice system, their risk factor has already increased. Another risk factor is LGBTQ and homelessness. 40% of homeless youth are LGBTQ. 60% have been sexually assaulted, and LGBTQ youth are 7.4 times more likely to become a victim of sexual violence than heterosexual youth. This is a very, um, and for, for a juvenile justice system, we have just begun exploring the rate of prevalence among LGBTQ youth. And that one, we're identifying them because we ask the questions. And then the second thing is we create an environment and work with individuals who we partner with, who are specialized in this area, who can talk to the youth and provide some level of support. What I found in talking to them is that they don't feel like they have the support at home. And then when they run away, they find these support networks who aren't very healthy and who will promise them things and promise to take care of them and make them feel like um, being LGBTQ in that community, they are safeguarded when in actuality they're being exploited. Traffickers prey on children and youth who have low self-esteem, minimal support, experience homelessness or runaway, or who are in foster care. I have not experienced, but by, and I'm saying this because by the time they make it to the juvenile justice system, I know of cases and I'm aware of cases of kids who came from a very healthy and functioning household and who met someone on the internet and things went bad really quick. However, those involved in the juvenile justice system typically have multiple risk factors and these are not children who have the best support system in place. I want you to see this video, Atlanta Sex Trafficking, the Chilling Statistics. And then after, um, if you have any questions about it, please feel free to send a, a question and answer in. Okay, I'm not sure what happened in the middle of that, but the video was available in another setting as well for you to look at. I showed this video to you so that you could see that in Atlanta, not only are they identifying that there is a problem, but they're using media to show the extent of the problem. So the video was used to not only educate other professionals, but community members. And when they start using videos such as this one, people started becoming more aware and wanting to know more information and how they could support um, in their communities, how they could identify the risk factors, and what they could do to better enhance any type of services available to you. The pathways for recruitment. Some of the places that we've identified as public places like bus, truck stops, fast food restaurants, and shopping malls, as well as youth runaway and homeless shelters, internet, social media. I can say that um, on my end, we have had an experience where one of our residential providers was allowing the youth to leave the residential home in the middle of the night, go to the park, meet up with their pimp, and then come back in by 6 o'clock in the morning when there was a staff change. These type of behaviors cannot be tolerated. They are going to look for homeless shelters. We have a case pending in Georgia where somebody has set up an online website 
pretending to be the FBI match task force, and they actually went to one of the residential pri providers for sex sexual exploitation in an attempt to interview a child. They set up a website where parents were thinking they were going to somebody for resources and that they had to provide all this information on this child, and this person was going to different places acting like a law enforcement officer there to help recover the youth and also recover, identify any potential exploiters. This is a, it's dangerous, but they're going to go where kids congregate. Backpage.com. Um, I kind of mentioned just quickly about the FBI task force. The Georgia Department of Juvenile Justice has um, signed on as members of the FBI task force, the task force that identifies and recovers um, victims of sexual exploitation. One of the main places that we are able to identify and do any intel to find our um, runaway youth is on Backpage. Backpage is like a Craigslist for sexual exploitation. The young ladies and men will set up websites here for you to determine what type of, they have a profile set up. Um, I, don't, I do not recommend that you go onto Backpage at work if you are interested in seeing more about it, but it is a website that has been utilized inappropriately where people are identifying individuals to have sex with, and children are on here as well. This website is routinely monitored and tracked by law enforcement so that they can use it to set up a out call, which is going to the place where the, um, to like the hotel, and the out call would be set up, and that's how we're able to recover a lot of our kids. It's a very dangerous website. There's other, other social media avenues that are being used as well, but this is one of the high profile ones. The developmental stages. This is not the developmental stage of a child. This is the developmental stage that occurs when someone is going through the pathway of exploitation. It starts with enticement, some type of financial gain. Then they learn the lifestyle. They feel a little powerful. They're able to adapt to the environment, learn some of the rules, and focus some of the rewards and benefits of the lifestyle. And now they're living the lifestyle. The trust in the game, they have an increased amount of time spent in prostitution, and they're slowly distancing themselves for so many conventional connections for a child like church, school, family. Once they're caught up in the lifestyle, this is when things start to change, and this happens very fast. This isn't something that happens over months. It can happen within a week, two weeks. Um, chronic depression, drug abuse, learned helplessness, physical and emotional health deterioration. And once, they, once they identify that they're ready to leave this lifestyle, they're taking stock and trying to get out. They believe that there is something better. And then reentry, loss of options. So although they identify that there's another lifestyle that's better than that, it's very stressful. It's a very stressful event for them to leave without the appropriate help and support. So as you're identifying and creating your programs in your various um, state, county, or local entities, use these developmental stages to see where could you intervene and where could you better serve um, a child. We have organizations in Georgia who work with at-risk youth versus those who work with those who are currently confirmed as being exploited and those who are of higher risk in that they've not only been confirmed, but they've been picked up multiple times. Here's another video. Hopefully this will work.
Okay. As you look at the video, I want you to think about some of the um, language that was used by the pimp in reference to the young ladies. In addition, how the young ladies um, perceived themselves while they were being exploited. I mean, this is very critical because when we were working with juveniles in the juvenile justice system, and they have um, their victims in, be, as being exploited, but yet at the same time, they're being treated as offenders. When you identify what is the best treatment approach to take with them, what is the best placement, that is something to take into consideration. Because it's very difficult to take a child and say, because you're on probation, you have to go to this school, and you have to follow these rules, when two days before, for the last month, they've been in an environment where being called a hoe is a common language, where being degraded is very common. So it's not easy to mainstream them back into the regular public school system or even into their natural home environment when that is how they perceive themselves. If they perceive themselves this way, they're going to think others perceive them that way as well. So they have to, they really need a very supportive environment um, when they're initially recovered and that it may not be very easy to immediately return them into what would be a mainstream or a typical household or environment. When you look at identifying a victim. So when I started this work, we have worked with, um, trained juvenile probation officers, they would ask me, okay, well, how do I know? What, what are some of the warning signs? Well, some of the big flag warning signs, particularly with kids who make it into a, a correctional setting, is chronic runaway. Truancy, when you're interviewing them and they tell you they've traveled, they have this frequent travel to other cities. Well, you know if they're not traveling with their parent and they're not traveling with a trusted caregiver or guardian, how are they affording to do this? Um, gang affiliation, when they talk about their boyfriend, they call them daddy. I um, did a training about a month ago with some um, staff in a juvenile detention center, and I talked to them, do they talk about their boyfriend and things like that? And they're like, yes, they will. Do they reference the boyfriend as daddy? They're like, yeah, they all do. And I'm like, that's a big flash and warning sign. That is a red flag. Ask them about daddy. Does daddy take care of you? Does daddy pay for your clothes? Does daddy help you live somewhere? Does daddy get your nails done? Um, children who are wearing very specially provocative clothes, they'll come in into intake in a detention center and they look like something has been going on. And another thing is parental history of prostitution arrest. Branding, these are some real tattoos of some of our kids. Um, and this is some of the branding that occurs. Pimps will brand the young ladies or men so that you can identify that they belong to you. So if you're mafia's property, then the expectation is that you don't go and work for somebody else. If you're working for somebody else, you're considered to be out of pocket. And if you are, they'll go and find somebody, track you down, and bring you back home. But we, we, we have tattoos where they're tattooing all the way across the chest. They may look a little like gang tattoos. But when they have like cash signs, property signs, it's so that they know this is who you, who owns you. This is a case example. We had a young lady in a rural part of Georgia, 14 years of old at the time that we identified her as being um, CSEC or sexually exploited. She had 10 plus runaways in two years. She became gang involved on the run. Her family history was divorced parents, parental conflict, and parental neglect. She was cognitively delayed and had emotional behavior disorders. She had been in um, learning assistance classes since about second grade. She had poor school performance, didn't have any identifiable friends, and very poor family boundaries. How we were, She didn't identify as having very poor family boundaries. This is what came out of the assessment, and I say that because she had a Facebook page set up, and she had been on the run from April until October. And while the family was not looking for her, they kept up with her while she was on Facebook. She had made it to multiple states, been picked up by a truck driver at a truck stop, went to Florida to participate in a biker weekend, began her sexual exploitation there, then made it to another place in Jacksonville, Florida, and was exploited there, met somebody, met a female pimp in the Florida area. That female pimp brought her back to Atlanta, 
They set her up a DAC Pages account, and that's how she was recovered. So she was on the run from April into September on her own without an account. It was just operating off of Facebook. But as soon as she set up her back pages account, she was able to be recovered. She was a high attention seeking child. This young lady was allowed us to establish a case because she was so angry that her pimp didn't get arrested and that she did that she began to tell on anybody that was involved. The one area that she did not tell on was the person she perceived to be her boyfriend in Florida who was gang involved. She would not tell on him. But we were able to do enough intel with, between the juvenile justice system and working with our FBI and law enforcement partners to pull off information from her Facebook account to establish a case. This young lady, um, just so you know, when she went home, she has run away several more times. However, she ran into family members' homes and she has been receiving a lot of in-home supportive services and the family has as well and they've responded pretty well. Some of the juvenile cases that we see are youth prior to some law changes and we have juvenile reform in the state of Georgia within the last two years. But prior to that, and we still have it happen unfortunately at times where judges are char charging the child with prostitution. But if you remember from the federal definition, any child under the age of 18 who is having these things occur, they're considered exploited. So these children should not be charged with prostitution. Their cases should be referred to your local child welfare office and be treated as an abuse case. However, this, there's still people who charge with prostitution, um, gang-related crimes, drug use and sale, theft, disorderly conduct, and status offenses. These are the top type of cases or, criminal or juvenile charges that will come to us that CSEC youth have been involved with. When you, when you look at all that, what do you do? Now you know the risk factors. Now you know the warning signs. Now what do you do with this child? From the intervention approach side of it, initially we just started working with, okay, let's first figure out if they're CSEC or not. And that wasn't working. We, um, prior to two years ago, we may have identified about 30 youth a year in the juvenile justice system who were considered exploited. Just this year alone, we've identified over 100 youth who have admitted to being exploited. These aren't youth who we assume are. The only way we confirm them as exploitation is that they self-identify or that law enforcement pick them up and self-identify them or identify them as being exploited. One of the key factors when working with our probation officers is getting them to see these exploited youth in a correctional setting from a very gender responsive and trauma informed approach. So when we do our training, we talk about trauma and life affect boys and girls differently. Girls are one of the fastest growing populations in the criminal justice system. When boys are upset, they respond with, to respond with anger and disassociation or when they're traumatized, when girls are traumatized, they respond with depression and anxiety. And another thing is that equal treatment does not mean the same treatment. So how we approach and identify those youth in our systems should not be the same. What is a trauma-informed approach? Trauma-informed services are sensitive to the pervasiveness of trauma and its impact on survivors, including how trauma affects a survivor's ability to cope, to access service, and to feel safe both physically and emotionally. It encourages programs to improve the identification, screening, assessment, and referral to appropriate services. It involves an integrated, integrating victim-centered policies and practices in juvenile systems that meet safety and security needs, as well as reducing risk, traumatization, and recidivism. I'm gonna give you one quick example. In the detention centers, the boys and girls used to wear orange jumpsuits. From a trauma-informed approach, you wouldn't want to put a child who has been victimized, sexually victimized, in an orange truck jumpsuit, and particularly a female child, because when you take the orange jumpsuit off, you're derobing every single time. So if you have to go to the restroom, instead of being able to just pull your pants down and sit, you can't. You have to take all of your clothes off to be able to do that. That can be very traumatizing to a child who's just been exploited, and imagine one who has been exploited on the streets and you just brought them in the night before 
you have to do all the required safety checks to make sure they're not harboring any weapons. Um, then you put them in this orange jumpsuit, and then you do the typical approaches of a pat down, a frisk search on this child. It doesn't work. You, their behaviors may increase or get worse during that time frame, and then everyone's wondering why is the child acting this way. Trauma-informed care, being abused or neglected as a child increases the likelihood of arrest as a juvenile. The arrest rates for trauma-exposed youth are up to eight times higher than the community samples of same age peers. 70 to 92 percent of incarcerated girls reported sexual, physical, or severe emotional abuse in childhood. And in 2003, OJJDP survey of youth in residential placement found that 70 percent of them had some type of past traumatic experience, with 30 percent having frequent, experienced frequent and or injurious physical and or sexual abuse. The staff in our detention centers and our mental health are trauma-informed trained. We have identified that on average, over 70% of the youth in our system have some history of trauma. The three E's when you look at trauma. What is the event and circumstances? How did the individual experience these events or circumstances helps determine whether it is a traumatic event? The long-lasting adverse effects on an individual are the result of the individual's experience of the event or circumstance. For staff who don't um, do victim services or are more knowledgeable about trauma, this is critical for them to know this. How that child or person experiences or understands their version of trauma is their version of the story. We have investigators and law enforcement officers who had to be highly trained on this area because they viewed it at what they assumed somebody should feel. And if you don't take into consideration how they feel about that event, then you're not taking a very trauma-informed approach, and that's the only place where you can start working with that client because with CSEC victims, they oftentimes don't view themselves as victims. So you have to start knowing and start your interview in any type of treatment process with someone who doesn't see themselves as being a victim. Some things to remember is that know what's wrong with you, but what happened to you. So when you're interviewing or doing a trauma-informed care, not what's wrong. You don't focus on the end result, but what happened through that process. Some of the symptoms of adaptation and violence causes trauma, and trauma can cause violence. One approach that we had to change in our um, assessment process was interviewing versus interrogating. Your common goal was to identify the truth. Some of the differences are non-accusatory versus accusatory interviews, gather information rather than trying to focus on getting a confession, the structure of the interview, participation, personal space, and time limit. We have um, explored and set up contracts with our local child advocacy centers so that the interviews don't always take place in a juvenile detention setting, that we are able to transport the child um, in a safe way or through come through a back door where we don't re-traumatize other children in the lobby, but take the child to the, the sexual assault center, the local sexual assault center, and let forensic sexual assault workers actually do the interview rather than staff who are not um, highly trained in this area. The goal for this interview should be to minimize trauma, maximize information, and minimize contaminating the child's memory, and maintain integrity over the interview process. One of the law enforcement officers who specializes in sexual exploitation and crimes against children cases told me that when working with CSEC victims, you have to take a little bit of a different approach than the typical sexual assault case. And that you have, in order for you to be able to attain the information that you need to protect them, as you, it takes multiple interviews, and the child has to get to a place where they trust you more than they trust that pimp. And during victim centered interviews, the goal is to gain that trust and confidence. Be clear that you're not there to hurt them. Make sure that the child understands their legal rights. Meet with them in a safe, non threatening child-friendly environment, appear neutral, provide affirmation during the interview, 
and do not threaten the victim. This was a this has been a very interesting area because if you ever listen to a typical law enforcement or investigative interview and they're trying to get to the end result, threats may occur. Well, if you don't tell me this, I'm going to lock you up. Well, if you tell me who who's been pimping you out, then I can take you to, you know, your mom's house or I can take you to a shelter. But if you don't tell me this, then I'm going to have to lock you up. Well, that approach is not a victim-centered approach, to interview, and it typically doesn't work because these kids who have been involved with the juvenile justice system don't fear being locked up. And another thing, like we talked about earlier, is refer to the case to local law enforcement special victims unit and child welfare. Identify and learn and use CSEC language. There is a dictionary of CSEC language. There is a dictionary of pimp language, because if you don't know what they're talking about, then it's very difficult when you're doing the interview. Um, when I interviewed the young lady I talked about earlier, there were some things I didn't know. I just had to play along with her like I knew what she was talking about so that I can continue on and gather information until she was um, not ready to talk anymore. Um, I have some attachments. Uh, they should be available to you, but if not, feel free to email email me. I can give you a list of um, CSEC type of language, pimp type of language that was developed by the FBI. Report building is important. This is a sample question that our match task force, our match FBI task force uses. When was the first time you ran away? They don't go in saying, I know you've been pimped out. I know you've been out on those streets. I caught you in a hotel. Why are you lying to me? And da 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 da. That's what we see would happen, but those who are highly trained in this area don't go in talking to a victim like they committed a crime. So where have you been staying? So this kind of established this process of where you've been, who's been taking care of you. How are you provided food and clothing? Do you have someone that you refer to as your boyfriend? Has your boyfriend been taking care of you? Has anyone forced you to do something? If you ask a C-sex victim, have you been sexually assaulted, they're going to typically respond no. If you ask them if they force someone to do something and then you explain what force means, then you're more likely to get that response out of them. Were you threatened if you try to leave? Do you owe someone any money? And who or what are you afraid of? Here's the do's and don'ts. Do meet the child where they are. Be non-judgmental. Keep the child talking as long as the child is ready to talk. This, you may have to do this interview during multiple interviews in order to keep that rapport. Understand the terminology and language and recognize signs of trauma. It's not, don't expect the child to see themselves as a victim. Don't force them to talk by threatening jail or expulsion. Don't treat the child as an offender and don't dispute the child's story. You know, the child may be telling you something that may sound a little off wall or the child may be telling you something that you know probably did not happen because they may not have been at that location or that place or things don't add up. But you don't want to dispute the child's story. You don't want to tell the child they're lying and why are you lying to me or, you know, let's talk when you're ready to tell the truth. Allow that child's version to be that version of the story and then determine in what direction you want to move with it at a later time. Here's some of the common words. Like I said, I can I, I don't want to go spend as much time going through all of it with you. However, these are some of the common languages that you'll see within um, the temp exploitation business. What we have found in Georgia is that having a collaborative approach is um, key to being able to not only identify the risk factors, but to intervene and to provide supportive services. Some of the services to CSEC use is a continuum of prevention, victim identification, and intervention. We have residential treatment and transitional services with short-term safe houses, long-term residential programs, outpatient prevention, at-risk, and supportive services. The psychosocial interventions that incorporate a trauma-focused approach and coordinated survivor-centered care. Uh, we utilize multidisciplinary organizations that they work together and they come together and discuss the cases from the medical side, the legal perspective, and mental health needs of survivors. 
and the survivor is the center, I should say, center of all the decisions concerning recovery and system involvement. I'm going to go over a couple of areas of collaboration. Our child, a child advocacy center in Georgia, in the Atlanta area, they provide, well, all the child advocacy centers can provide forensic interviews, advocacy, and therapeutic counseling services. However, in the state of, um, in, in Atlanta, in the Georgia Child Advocacy Center, they also have additional services where that they provide outpatient trauma-informed counseling services to victims or at-risk youth for sexual exploitation. The child, the cost, the services are at no cost to the victim. The family and or caregiver is given a transportation voucher to get that child to that program. And then that child, while the only requirement is that the child has to get to the actual site location. However, there's additional supportive services to help that family so that transportation is no longer a barrier. At the Children's Healthcare Hospital here in the Atlanta area, they, they actually have an on-site um, sexual assault center as well. And they provide, they too provide medical exams. They also have a multi-agency task force that meets monthly. That task force includes law enforcement professionals, medical care, child advocacy centers, um, residential providers, the foster care system, juvenile justice system, and they will come to talk about any sexual exploitation cases that came through the um, children's hospital. In addition, other individuals there can bring up cases to see if there's any information that could be shared among partners to either identify a case or to provide supportive services. For example, if I have a young lady who is not in the Atlanta area, but I want to discuss the case because they traveled to Atlanta and they were involved with um, another system, um, like a local law enforcement, then I can discuss that case at that time. Direct care providers that are capable you, um, I found that over the last two years, as people become more interested in being involved with um, human trafficking, sexual exploitation cases, they're also wanting to take those youth in, but they're not pre prepared to be able to deal with the complex trauma. So you'll want to have a, dip a direct care provider who is capable of addressing complex trauma, trauma bonds, and poly victimization. Another collaborative partner is law enforcement. We in the state of Georgia have increased the um, changes in laws in reference to how law enforcement could arrest somebody, whether it's the um, the John, which is the buyer, the bottom, which is a, somebody who is assisting in the process. A bottom is another um, person who is considered a prostitute or a child that's sexually exploited who will look out for or um, for their pimp and make sure the other girls that are involved are staying on target with what they're supposed to be doing. Um, law enforcement, they, we have trained law enforcement officers. We have created pocket cards in the state of Georgia so that law enforcement officers will have a quick guide. For example, there was a case here that made national attention where a law enforcement officer in a rural community identified a victim of sexual exploitation through a traffic stop. And during that traffic stop, the um, Law enforcement officer utilized the training that they were provided, which is post-certified training, and had a pocket card that identified some risk factors and was able to pull that victim aside and identify that they were being victimized. The school system. We are working with the school system to provide training to staff um, and to develop some type of program that we could deliver to kids. The FBI Match Task Force, which is our largest law enforcement partner, because they bring, not only do they bring state and county and local law enforcement together, they also um, have the juvenile justice system and the Department of Corrections on the task force as well. Child welfare has been our biggest partner. Through changes in laws and children being treated as CHINS kids rather than um, juvenile offenders, we're able to refer the cases to child welfare for um, for the case to be treated as a abuse case rather than an offense case. And multiple state and federal agencies who um, partake in our multi-agency task forces as well. One of the direct care providers that I would like to highlight for you is Georgia Cares. It was created as an initiative under the Governor's Office for Children and Families in 2009. Georgia Cares is an independent nonprofit 
organization working to serve child sex trafficking victims in the state of Georgia. Georgia Cares is a single statewide coordinating agency to connect services and treatment care for victims. The Georgia Care staff follow the victim throughout their process of treatment and recovery to lead healthy, successful lives as productive members of society. What do they do? They function as a single point of entry to refer children identified as being commercially sexually exploited. Now, I can tell you that in Georgia, the age of consent for sex is the age of 16. However, the sexual exploitation and trafficking laws says that a child can be exploited up to the age of 18. So Georgia Cares provides services for children up to the age of 18. They employ licensed social workers who conduct assessments to determine if a child is exploited or at risk. They collaborate with different agencies like the foster care system, juvenile justice, the child's family, to determine the best placement for the child or community. A child can be referred from a family, does not have to be referred from another agency or a collaborative partner. It can be a self-referral or it can be the family calling saying, I need help. They provide continual care coordination, follow-up, and evaluation to ensure each child and their family recovers and thrives. They train communities and professionals on warning signs and resources, and they maintain a 24-hour hotline for victim services and response. This is their process. So within 48 hours of referral, they do a screening. Then within 48 hours of the screening, they have crisis management services as well. And I can tell you this process is expedited, um, typically when law enforcement is involved and they identify a child and they say, we need help. Georgia Cares can provide, they have a limited amount of bed space that they will pay for um, some of our contracted providers to temporarily house the youth um, while the case is being addressed or resolved through the child welfare system. So their intake assessment is a interview and assessment process that is done within seven days of the referral. They have um, service planning, so they develop a case plan. Now their case plan, I can say this for example, and the juvenile justice probation officer may have one case plan. The case plan doesn't trump any court orders, but it provides a guideline for service providers on what they think is the best care plan or action that should occur. So after they do the care planning, they have case monitoring and case closure and follow-up. They will work with our kids as long as we ask them to. Um, not only will they work with our kids with doing the assessment, they come to our site locations as well. So we don't have to transport the children to their offices. They come to where the child is located. Our law enforcement match task force, like I said earlier, was one of our um, main law enforcement providers. And through our involvement with the MATCH Task Force, we've been able to increase opportunity for joint investigation. We have federal and local agents assist with recovering a CSEC victim. They assist with training local law enforcement, and we have increased access to resource and intel, and they minimize multiple law enforcement victim center interviews. So we reduce some of the problems that we were having. We were having our local investigators do the interview, and then a police officer would come and do the interview, and then we would send them to the hospital for the children's health care office to do an interview. If our match task force is involved with the recovery of the youth, we all get together and to discuss the case, and that child may be immediately brought by that task force officer to the children's health care for a screening prior to being placed in, in whatever the most unsafe a placement is for that child. So you don't have five or six people interviewing them within a very short time frame. And outreach. Um, through juvenile justice, we utilize various grants and um, other services to really put out their um, information about this. We have created, this is one sample of one of our posters. We also use this poster as a pocket card as well. And the posters are located in our probation offices. They're located in our detention centers. And anyone who has called and asked for any of the posters, we have provided to them. So we have local mental health, local foster care, our statewide um, victim services agency, and any other local child advocacy centers. And we have several numbers on here so that children can call at any time if to uh, self-disclose or um, find out any resources or assistance they may need. We have, um, like I said, we have, a, in addition to the posters and the pocket cards, we also on our Georgia Department of Juvenile Justice website 
have a section for victim services and sexual exploitation. We get several um, hits on our phone number, either from the, our Office of Victim Services or the Georgia CARES line of youth who are self-reporting, particularly in the, in the detention centers. And in the state of Georgia, they have um, had, through private, public-private partnerships, created multiple PSAs to get the um, message out there. During some of our big um, sports or entertainment venues, they have used different um, media outlets to kind of provide some type of shock um, advertising on the amount of exploitation that occurs during these times. And training. Not only do my staff and, the, and DJJ provide training, but Georgia Cares provides training, Children's Healthcare of Atlanta provides free online training, and some of our other state and local partners as well. What is the impact? I think I discussed this earlier, but children who have been recovered from sex, sexual exploitation may have a difficult time integrating into a normal childhood. Some of the impact on victims are complex systems of history and trauma, medical care. I, there has not been one CSEC victim that hasn't come into my detention center that I have talked to, I'm not saying it hasn't happened, that hasn't had multiple STDs. It is very traumatizing, not only trying to treat the child, but even discuss with them what that means. They have a very limited understanding of what the complex medical care that they will require and how they can better protect themselves. Um, physical abuse, heightened risk of unwanted wanted pregnancies, psychological and emotional well-being, depression, anxiety, self-harm, PTSD, hostile and aggressive behaviors, and emotionally withdrawn. Impact on the juvenile justice system. Some of the things that, you know, as victim service providers, the key is decriminalization of prostitution. Children should not be criminalized because they're exploited. And the school to prison pipeline. The more the more educators are um, aware of the risk factors and signs of exploitation, the less likely they are to refer them to a criminal justice type of agency. Um, I like this quote: "If there is nowhere to hold them and nowhere safe for them to go, law enforcement has no alternative. If they aren't placed in a juvenile detention facility, the child could run back to the prostitution scenario." This is so true. This is true not only among juvenile justice staff, law enforcement, and child welfare. If we don't create environments where children can be safely housed or protected who are exploited, then juvenile detention facilities become the backup. And in one of our juvenile detention facilities, when you have 40 young ladies housed, and out of those 40, 30 have been sexually exploited, you, don't, you not only increase their opportunity to exploit other people, but you give them another avenue of resources in a, um, a non-healthy way. From law enforcement's perspective, some of the things noted are shortages of resources, programs that they need to deal with victims, program, programs find dealing with victims to be too dangerous, and challenges to identifying victims. Some of the impacts on communities, criminalizing nonviolent youth, negatively impact a child's ability to become productive citizens. Um, the more a child who is nonviolent is put in an environment around violent, other violent youth, they're more likely to become violent. Incarcerating nonviolent youth, youthful offenders is costly to the juvenile justice system. Incarcerating low-risk youth increases recidivism rates and increases chances to associate with violent offenders. Some of the challenges when working with um, sexually exploited youth are limited treatment services, limited data on domestic cases, limited resources for school and administrators to implement in schools, improving social and legal options for victims, improving state laws to stop the demand, and con community acceptance of the problem. Here's my last video that I'd like to show you.
that particular um, video was um, it, it did happen and they used shock advertisement to see how people would respond. So the responses that you saw from those on the street were live, filmed live. They weren't they weren't actors. The only actors actresses in the video were those that were um, serving as victims of sexual exploitation. But the responses from those in the community were realistic, and it was to bring attention to that because of the number of individuals. Atlanta is at high risk for its sexual exploitation because it's an international airport, and during sporting venues, the risk increases. And so that was to not only raise awareness, but to make people feel a little uncomfortable about um, wanting to identify or purchase a young person for sexual purposes. Our, during that time frame, our local FBI match task forces were on heightened um, awareness and were doing had a lot of intel operations going on where they were able to recover um, over a dozen CSEC victims. When working with CSEC victims, the one thing I can say is this. It takes a unified response. It is a very complex issue. It's not something that's going to always occur during one intervention. It may not occur, but by just having law enforcement being aware of it, it takes everybody to be aware, un understand the risk factors and the multiple treatment needs and um, opportunities. You can't give up on them when working with them because they may run away 12 times before you get them to understand the risk factors associated with running away and what happens when they're out um, being exploited and how their pimp is not their boyfriend, their pimp doesn't love them, and that there is an opportunity in life to be in a safe and supportive environment. Um, that is all I have for the presentation. I hope that you were able to gain some basic understanding of sexual exploitation, um, the risk factors, how to intervene, and collect, um, create a collaborative approach. Um, I would like to open it for questions at this time. Thank you so much, Latera. That was wonderful. Um, so we do have a few questions. The first one was regarding your first uh, video, the yes. chilling statistics. They yes. were wondering where those numbers were were coming from. Those numbers were from the Atlanta Sex Trafficking um, Commission. They had there was a it's a multi agency commission that put together an interview process of um, identifying how many people were trying to purchase um, victims. And, as, and if you open up the video link, it'll have those additional uh, resources available to you as far as who conducted the study. But the study was done several years ago. I want to say it was done about four, four or five years ago. And in one of the studies, what they did was they set up fake sites. They set up fake sites and they had people um, how many hits they had to that site to purchase an under a known underage victim. Thank you. Um, the another question was, do you recommend that detectives use the back page website? Yes. I recommend that detectives use the back page website and if they're not comfortable with how to um, connect can um, draw down intel and set up any type of operation that they work with their um, FBI task force in their community because they have the resources to be able and they, they um, through their task forces they can share some of those resources if you sign on as a partner. So if you are a local law enforcement detective, you can go that way. If you're a detective through a, a state agency that's criminal justice, you can also sign on as well. Thank you. Julia asked, well, Julia said thank you for the information, and then she asked, is the free online training you mentioned available to us in California? Yes. The, um, the organization is Children's Healthcare of Atlanta, and they provide multiple trainings around sexual exploitation for mental health, medical, law enforcement, um, and general services and trauma services. Thank you. Patricia would like to know um, what type Hold of... On, let, me, uh, let, me, let me go back to that question. Children's Healthcare of Atlanta and it's the Stephanie V. Blank Sexual Assault Center. Okay. So are we ready for the next one? Yes. Okay. 
Patricia would like to know what type of curriculum can be utilized in juvenile detention centers to educate juveniles on this topic. Okay, so right now we are in progress of creating a curriculum. Um, we work with an organization who is who provides a at-risk curriculum for those in the um, who are considered at risk but not confirmed. And when it comes to youth who are in the detention center and confirmed victims, I would recommend that you um, you have to create a, a trauma-informed type of curriculum. But we have not created one for the, the confirmed youth because we remove them from the detention center as fast as we can. But if you can create one, it would be one that's trauma-informed. And depending on if it's a short or long-term detention center, from a short-term detention center, you would want to have a five-session one to discuss the risk factors, um, how to safely remove themselves from that environment, who they can contact when they're in that environment, and a supportive type of um, service where they feel like they're not alone. When it comes to the at-risk youth, we are in progress of creating a curriculum that should be finalized within, it actually will be finalized by the first week of December, and it is a two-hour session as the first one, but it's going to end up being a five-hour one, I mean a five-session program, one hour apiece, where kids are educated on things about um, social media, how um, how the glamorization of videos and how people will try to say they can put you in a, a movie, um, they can have you model, and how to avoid some of the pitfalls of, um, of things that pimps will say to lure you into the game, how to keep yourself safe if you do run away, and who to call, just things of that nature. Um, but the other thing is we um, contracted with the Chicago Alliance Against Sexual Exploitation and they have a program to stop the demand. It is a five session program to educate boys on healthy boundaries and relationships and not to become pimps or not to want to exploit their girlfriends or friends or anyone else they know. And that is an excellent resource. They will come to you um, and it's a very inexpensive training. And they have a set curriculum. Thank you. Are the terms used, are they the same throughout the U.S. or are they different in different locations? Um, well, federally the term is domestic minor sex trafficking. Um, in the state of Georgia, we were using the term commercial sexual exploit. Are you to referring to CSEC terms or um, like the, the definitions of um, like a pimp, um, out call, in call, the pimp tactic terms? It's unclear. Clear. Um, the question was just, are the terms used the same? Okay. Um, well, when it comes to the definition, I'll, I'll just address both. And when it comes to the definition of human trafficking, there's going to be federal terms. Like I said, in Georgia, we use the term commercial sexual exploitation because at the time that the law was drafted, and that, that probably too will change, but at the time the law was drafted, the federal government wasn't using the term domestic minor sex trafficking. However, we're trying to go to that more federal standard as well. When it comes to the pimp tactics and terms, that's pretty universal. You would be amazed that you can Google search pimp dictionary and you will find the same things. So those terms are pretty universal. Thank you. Um, I noticed that stripping was included in the definition of commercial sex acts. Is this nationwide? The, this individual is calling from Portland, and they said that it doesn't seem to be something that is ever considered. Yes, it happens nationwide. I mean, we have kids that we have picked up, and, and Portland has been a very, uh, an ironically, um, an increased place where we've had to recover some of our youth um, that make their way to Portland, Oregon. But um, we have cases where they are picked up or found in a strip club. And the erotic components of a strip club, it doesn't, you know, sex doesn't have to be um, penetration. Thank you. Uh, our next question is, it is very frustrating for me to see that many of our shelters for our CSEC victims are limited and are located in high-risk areas. How do we begin advocating? Um, one thing that we have worked on is how to create the public-private partnerships 
where you can have a, a private entity who is known for um, their experience with working with high-risk youth um, and identify some type of partnership with either child welfare or juvenile justice to contract with them to set up programs in, in communities that aren't on a bus line where a child could just run and catch the bus um, to where they came from and putting them in areas where they may be more supportive because of the locality itself. Uh, the other thing is you definitely wouldn't want to work with somebody who has that experience with one, working with at-risk youth, and then train them st their staff on trauma-informed services. But I think that question is a pretty, um, I'll say, state-to-state -state issue in that we have the, some of the same issues as well. Okay. Uh, our next one is from Eric. He works as a probation department in the probation department in Northern California. They are setting up their process and they're just starting to educate themselves. Where can you refer us for additional trainings and education? Um, the Children's Healthcare of Atlanta is one good site for additional training and education. If you, I'm not sure in California if your probation officers are considered kind of post certified or not. But if they are considered post-certified um, at Georgia, our Georgia Post Academy as well has training, and you may be able to contract out. We could um, set something up. Your local FBI Match Task Force also provides training. Every state has a FBI Match Task Force. If you'll Google search FBI Match Task Force, um, sexual exploitation or Internet crimes against children, that part of the FBI, they provide training as well. Thank you. And I think our next two questions really back to our earlier conversation. Um, what was the name of the curriculum used in Chicago? It's called the Case Foundation. It's, um, if you, it's ch the, ch the Chicago Alliance Against Sexual Exploitation. Thank you. And, and I can provide you with that number if you would like. All right. Um, Okay. Do you just want to read that one? Yes, his, the the um the trainer is Caleb. His name is Caleb Probst, P R O B S T. Well, let me give you his email address. It would be the best way to um, reach him. And it's C A L E B as in boy at C A A S as in Sam E dot org. Thank you. Okay, and then um, the same person was wondering, is there a website available to view the objectives of the training targeted towards boys? Yes, it's on their website. Okay. See if there are any other questions. Um, doesn't look like there are any more. Thank you so much, Latera. We well, thank you, and I appreciate it. Oh, I was going to say the same thing. Sorry. Well, if there are no more questions, um, we will put up a link to the PowerPoint later and okay. uh, send out more information on how to contact Latera. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you. And um, we also want to thank the Casey Foundation one more time. All right. Thank you very much, everyone.